This episode is brought to you by my 10-week Fertility Awareness Mastery Group Program. If you're listening in real time, registration for my January 2018 groups is now open. To reserve your spot today, make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash group program. That's fertilityfriday.com slash group program. This is the Fertility Friday Podcast, episode number 173. Welcome to the 173rd episode of the Fertility Friday podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Lisa from fertilityfriday.com, and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I've got a great interview for you today. Today I'm interviewing Laura Owen, and I had the opportunity to meet Laura at the Justice Conference earlier this year. She was a keynote speaker. And she did a number of different topics. And I think what I really appreciated the most was her perspective on menstruation and also the historical context. So our interview today, we get into some of these issues. And I think you'll be really interested to hear her perspective on menstruation and basically how women are managing that in our current day society. So I think you're really going to enjoy it. And just as a reminder, if you are considering joining the the Fertility Awareness Mastery Group Program, make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash group program and get in your application as soon as you can. Uh, If you're listening to this in real time, I'm wrapping up registration right away here and we will be starting our groups in January. So the second week of January, we are going to be we're going to hit the ground running. So if you have been thinking about it, if you're on the fence, this is the last call, (laughs) last call. So make sure to head over again to fertilityfriday.com slash group program and uh, apply if you're wanting to be part of the group. So without further ado, let's jump into today's episode. And today I'm very excited to welcome my guest, Laura Owen to the show. I met Laura recently at the Justice Conference out in BC in August, and I was just thrilled. She was actually the keynote speaker. And so all of the talks that I was able to be present for, it was just incredible. So I'm really excited to have her on the show today. Laura is recognized internationally for her pioneering work on the menstrual cycle. She is the author of Her Blood is Gold, Awakening to the Wisdom of Menstruation, and has taught on menstruation and menopause for many years. She began her career working as a doctor of Chinese medicine, specializing in the treatment of women, and later trained in psychotherapy and is now an academic and consultant. Originally from the UK, Laura is in Melbourne, so we're doing a time zone warp to have uh, our conversation today. And she's doing PhD research there on menstruation in organizational context, department management, so lots of things. Laura is very busy. And in today's show, we'll be talking about the importance of reclaiming menstruation as a powerful part of being a woman. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Laura. Thank you, Lisa. It's great to be talking to you. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Before we jump in and talk about our main topic, I really, I always like to start by asking my guests a little bit about what brought them to their work. And I would love to hear how you ended up focusing so much of your work on the menstrual cycle specifically? Well, I think my interest in the menstrual cycle first began like it does for many people, I think, when I came off the pill. So when I was about 22, I'd been on the pill and on off for about four years, and I had started to become increasingly anxious. And I thought, well, I'll just see if it's got anything to do with the pill, but I didn't really know. And so after about two weeks of stopping taking it, I had this thought that I felt like myself again. Mm. And I thought, goodness, that's an interesting thought. There's a lot of implications with that. Did somehow being on the pill stop me feeling like myself? And in which case, you know, what was that about? So I started then to track my cycle. And uh, I had a little room in a big share house in the countryside in Warwickshire. I just graduated from university and I remember this room really well because after a few months it ended up the walls were all covered with these charts that I was creating of my cycle and I didn't know any formalized way to do this I just made it up because this was in the late 1970s so people were just starting to think about charting So from doing that and reading what I could find about it, I started to uh, become aware of my cycle. And then it just sort of snowballed from then. Gradually over the next decade, I started paying more and more attention to my cycle. I was, you know, if you fast forward another three years, I was by then practicing Chinese medicine. And from that tradition, I learned about 
uh, various things that were important to do with the menstrual cycle, like resting on the first day of bleeding, for example. And then I studied with a Native American teacher. And uh, in that tradition, there's a, a great deal of wisdom, as you know, about the menstrual cycle, psychically and spiritually, as well as physically. So my the information I got hold of gradually changed over time. And I brought all of that into my own experience. But really, I, I just became fascinated by it because I realized it was actually a source of strength to be connected to my cycle and to understand it. And that was such a turnaround from how I'd been trained by my culture to think of it. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm really happy that you shared your story. And as you can imagine, after doing so many different interviews, I've also recently uh, been doing a bit of a series. I've interviewed a lot of women who have come off pill, uh, who have yeah. shared their experience on the podcast of many of them not even knowing that the pill was doing anything to them until they came off, kind of like you said, discovering that you feel like yourself now. Mm. And so it's it's very strange and to keep hearing that same experience over and over again, it infuriates yeah. me yeah. on a very deep level. So, so let's talk about menstruation. You know, for so many women, menstruation is a source of disgust, a source of frustration. In our culture really inspires us to really disengage with our cycles. So maybe you could talk a little bit just about the idea that there is actually power in our menstruation that we sh that we could benefit from connecting to. Yes, and to go back to your first question, you know, this is really what's kept me in this work for so long is once I understood that in fact what I've been taught about menstruation was actually the opposite of what it potentially could be for women, I realized so much power was locked up in our suppression of the menstrual cycle that it just became a real passion for me to to talk about this and write about it and research it because I think it's a really crucial part of women becoming empowered and you know really moving beyond the sexist culture that we've lived in for a very long time so I see the suppression of menstruation as an integral part of the patriarchy uh, I look at it um, in a long-term historical perspective that uh, telling women that what they do once a month for several days is disgusting and shameful is a really good way of controlling women because women can't help menstruating unless they're using some kind of much more contemporary medication. But historically, women couldn't help menstruating. And so giving that message that something that only women do, you know, that biological men don't do, that that thing that separates us from men is disgusting. This is an incredibly potent way of making women feel less powerful and less good about themselves and less confident. One week every month for 40 years, you're doing something that you're told is gross or whatever word happens to be dominant in the culture at the time, or it's not even talked about at all and you have to pretend that nothing's going on. So these are all various devices that keep women in their place. And then the last 100 years, or particularly the last 50 years, we've gone through this big cultural shift in terms of women's empowerment in that women have gradually become more economically independent. But I think there's been a transition time from, you know, in this process, I hope it's a transition time from a patriarchy to a more egalitarian society in, in gendered terms. And during that transition time, women have had to pretend to be like men in order to get ahead. So I think this links into why we've been so willing to take medication that suppresses menstruation and why a large part of the female population still is very willing to do that because it makes life a lot easier if you don't have a period or you know you have a very light period but my hope is that by women who do actually experience the empowering nature of a fully lived menstrual cycle that we'll start to turn that corner as well and we'll move into a society where women can have their natural cycle and still feel empowered through it. I'd like to talk a little bit more about that idea because, you know, I believe that in one of your lectures at the Justice Conference, you were kind of speaking into that idea that menstruation is that final last taboo. And in terms of living in a world that requires us 
to pretend to be men and to pretend not to be menstruating. How do we address the, the practicalities of that situation? Because a lot of the women listening, you know, it's all well and good, but you still have to go to work and you still have to, you still have to do all the things. So how do we reconcile becoming more knowledgeable about our cycles and also having to live in the world that is still very patriarchal, that still requires us to do and do more? Yeah, I think we have to look on this as a, a long-term project. You know, <laughs> Rome wasn't built in a day and all those cliches. I think at the moment, women are in a real double bind about this because if you do become aware of your cycle, then you start wanting to adjust your workload to the cycle because you realize that you actually feel better if you do a bit less when you've got your period in the knowledge that you're going to do more at other times of the cycle. And what most women experience that I've I found, certainly this was my own experience over many years, was that if I could do a bit less when I had my period, then I would have a less symptomatic period the next month. And I think that the current bordering on epidemic of endometriosis may be related to the fact that women continue to work very hard through their period. That's another big topic we could get into. So I think at the moment it's a bit of a double bind because once you become aware of it, then you don't want to work in the old way that you did. And then the danger is that you'll become unemployable because women are expected to be like men in the workplace and to not have a cycle. So this is a problem. So the way I'm addressing this through my research is I'm looking at organizations which are introducing uh, menstrual workplace policies that support women in adjusting their workload to the cycle. And together with these organizations or one organization I'm specifically working with at the moment, which is going into this in some depth, is to explore what happens in the workplace when you do that. Are, are there some benefits to an organization if it does allow women to honor their cycle in terms of having more flexibility around how much they work at different times of the cycle? And I think this I think this is becoming more possible now because we're much more open to the idea of flexibility. And in fact, because of modern technology, many workplaces find that flexibility actually is, is really a productive way of organizing labor. You know, we have the potential to start moving in that direction. The other side of it is that we also need women need to feel empowered enough to ask for this. So I think the last 50 years of women becoming overall more empowered in many ways is an important factor and that's why I think we're entering a time when it's going to be possible to develop menstrual workplace policies and to start making workplaces just more amenable and more accommodating to the realities of women's biology. Well and I completely agree I've said it to you and I've said it on a number of occasions that you know I just menstrual products should just be in the bathroom just like everything else just like toilet paper because it's something as you said that every woman does every month for their you know for 40 years of their life and so we need to really acknowledge and accept that so the question that came to mind is you know part of the reason in in my opinion that you know that women worked so hard to kind of be like men was just to be thought of as equal you know, there was a the whole concept behind the fact that women weren't allowed to work because of the idea that they were inferior because they had their menstrual cycles and that that made them such that they couldn't equally participate. So how do you file that? I would put that the other way around. Ah. I would say that women weren't in the workplace because it suited the economics of the society to not have women in the workplace. And that the menstrual cycle was used as a method to keep women disempowered rather than the menstrual cycle itself being the first thing. Do you see mm -hmm. what I mean? It's a reframe of that. So, you know, it's hard in some ways look at different historical times that we can never compare them directly to our own because there was a whole different set of circumstances in them. But if you look at society before, say, the 1930s and 40s, which is when women began entering the workplace, but not really until the 1950s and 60s. Society before then was limited in many ways in terms of what jobs were available. And society functioned very differently in that one income could support a household, whereas now it can't. If you're going to own your own home, both parents, if it's a family, both parents need to be working, right? in most situations. So we actually need women to go out to work now just to maintain a standard of living that 50 years ago you could have from one income. 
But also there weren't the same kinds of jobs or jobs were perceived differently. For example, until about 20 years ago, the vast majority of people who worked in banks were male and certainly whoever got above cashier level in a bank. And working in a bank was seen as a prestigious occupation. Bank managers were seen on a par with magistrates and doctors. Mm. And they were considered to be, you know, authorities and people you could depend on and rely on and they were trustworthy. That all changed from the 1980s on when banks started to be seen with suspicion. Um, The finance industry became deregulated and therefore became more corrupt in certain ways. And women started being seen as, as attractive employees for banks because they could be paid less. And banking as a profession, unless you're in, you know, the higher echelons of it, but banking in a high street bank started to become like a retail occupation rather than something that had any prestige or sense of authority associated with it. So consequently, you get banks now are full of female employees. So you see, that's just one Mm. example of how society changes over time and how women's position is used and not used. So we had a time when you know, white men didn't want women going to work unless they were going to work in really low grade jobs because they didn't want them to be competing with them. Then society needed women to be out at work. And now we're in a situation where actually we've almost got equal numbers of women working apart from when women are on maternity leave. But most of the, there's still a pay pay gap, a big pay gap still in operation. So men are still being paid more. Mm -hmm. Even for the, I, I remember not really getting it, especially as a younger woman, but the fact that literally you could be doing the exact same job and you probably are. And the men in the position are making more. The men man down the hall who's doing the same exact job. I know it's shocking (laughs) and it still goes on. But this is one of the problems about bringing menstrual awareness into the workplace is there's a good reason women haven't wanted to talk about menstruation or menopause at work. There's a good reason why women have flocked to taking medications like the pill and use menstrual suppression while they're at work through medication because it makes it easier to look as if you're the same as a man. Now, it's becoming obvious that in some ways, I don't want to get too essentialist about this, but there's, you know, there's evidence that, for example, having women on boards actually makes a board more effective and less likely to to take stupid risks. There's plenty of evidence that that women perform at a very high level in the workplace. I'm not going to get into whether they're better than men in some ways, but there's certainly no reason to say that women are not as good as men at most jobs or vice versa. You know, women and men can have a great deal of variety within those sexes and there's no reason to not hire a woman for jobs at all levels. But we don't want to excite any controversy around that and make it harder for women to take up roles in the workforce. So it's understandable that menstruation and menopause have been seen as unmentionables. But unfortunately, I think that also holds women back. And it makes women vulnerable to suffering from ill health, because menstruation and menopause are actually part of life. And it is there is a demand on the body having a female reproductive system. Now, it also has benefits. And it may be one of the reasons women live longer. We still don't really understand fully the gender difference in life expectancy. But it's still the case that it takes a certain amount of self-care to have a period every month and to go through menopause. And that women do better, it seems, when they can adjust their work during those phases. And there's some really interesting initiatives happening around menopause at the moment, which for interesting cultural reasons seems to be a bit easier to tackle than menstruation at work. Mm -hmm. Well, especially because it's shrouded in such shame. It's really tricky to actually pull all of this apart because there are so many different strands coming into it. And there's the, you know, there's the ancient taboo around menstruation and the idea that menstrual bleeding is shameful and that there's nothing more terrible than having menstrual blood show on your clothing. You know, every woman has some experience of mortification from bleeding onto a sheet when they're staying at somebody's house or getting up from a chair and there's a blood stain on it. I mean, when you talk to women in groups, as I have done for years and years and years, everybody has a story like this. So the sense of shame around menstruation is ancient and deeply embedded. And shifting that is a big piece of work 
for societies to do. You know, we've had this really interesting breakthrough over the last five years where menstruation is now talked about in the media. It's a word you can say in public, which it didn't used to be. You know, when I was writing Her Blood is Gold in the late 80s and early 90s, it was first published in 1993. I'd go to a party. I was living in California. And I'd go to a party and someone would say, oh, what are you doing? And I'd say, I'm a writer. And they'd say, what are you writing about? And I'd say, oh, I'm writing a book on menstruation. <laughs> and they'd fall over. I mean, I, I've seen grown men blanch, you know, just go white in the face, move away and talk to someone else. It actually happened to me the other day. It still happens that wow. someone would just go, oh. they just can't cope with someone who talks about periods in public. But it's nowhere near as bad as it used to be. And particularly in the last three or four years, we've seen, a, you know, a real shift. But that shift has been building since the 1960s. You mm. know, so it's taken 40 years for us actually be able to have, you know, to, uh, articles about menstruation in mainstream newspapers, to be able to have an informed discussion in public about endometriosis, to actually have analyzed the fact that it takes seven to 10 years to get a diagnosis for endometriosis, despite the fact that 10 to 20% of women, menstruating women suffer from it. And it's a highly debilitating condition. Seven to 10 years. Can you imagine if men had that amount of pain for seven to 10 years and no one diagnosed it? Well, and it's interesting because it's only recently that the pain is even being acknowledged that women are experiencing. And, you know, something that that you said earlier about, I mean, there's a there's a cost to suppressing your menstrual cycle. And I feel like that Absolutely. is what needs to come to light now, because all these years women have been not very happily taking the pill. Maybe they are weren't aware of it <laughs> because, you know, after having all these conversations with women about their experiences, you know, your doctors typically are not telling you about the depression, about the you know the hormonal imbalances the nutritional imbalances the fact that you're more likely to feel anxious and have paranoid thoughts and straight up anxiety attacks things like that so when women experience those things they have no idea to even connect it so maybe you could talk a little bit just about that cost and you also talked about the health consequences and now we're talking about endometriosis and why it's kind of on the rise and i feel like you know, from my personal experience and also, you know, doing all these interviews and all that, working with clients, when you are suppressing your cycle, you are not connected to what's happening in your body. And so your inner alarm system is not able to, to tell you anything. So you're just kind of ignoring, you, you could be completely exhausted and there could be all these different things going on in your body, but because you're suppressing your cycle, you're just completely disconnected. Yes, yeah, so I think this is... This is interesting to look at in a, you know, a, an over, overarching social system context because it's not only the women's bodies that have been suppressed at work, but men's bodies too. And with men, we used to see it. We don't see it quite so much anymore because of changes in diet and exercise, but we used to see it in, in the form of heart attacks. You know, the stereotype of the man who works really hard and then drops out of a heart attack in his mid-40s. So denial of the body is a, a long-standing ethic, if you like, of many workplaces. And in many ways, it's got worse as, as capitalism has accelerated. So as we've entered more and more, you know, addiction to growth, and we've become, you know, greedier and greedier, really, we've come to expect more and more convenience and luxury and whatever in our lives. Far from being freed from work, we've actually worked harder and harder and harder. And now we've got email all the time and you know people's phones are going off in the middle of the night with text messages from their employers and you know that the boundaries are shot to bits for many people in terms of their working life and so ignoring the body is something that happens in many workplaces or suppressing the body but in women it it goes to another level because of the menstrual cycle and so we're suppressing that as well as everything else that's being suppressed so and when you talk about doctors not telling women, from interviewing doctors, what I think is going on there is that the doctors aren't, they don't want to know about it either. So they're in denial themselves. It's not that they're choosing not to tell women. Some of them might be. But for many of the doctors who are dispensing the pill willy-nilly to every 14-year-old who walks in the door who's got a bit of acne, any 18-year-old who says she's having regular sex with her boyfriend or whoever it is, 
they would just give them the pill straight away without telling them anything about the side effects. And I think, you know, that there's a lot of reasons for that. One is it's the, you know, apparently easiest thing. It's a short term solution to the thorny problem of unplanned pregnancy, which has beset women's lives forever. So it looks like a solution to a very old and difficult problem that has become more difficult because we're put off the age of first pregnancy now later and later and later because that's a demand of neoliberalism really that women build up their career before they start a family Mm -hmm. so by the time they're doing it you know they're already way past the optimum time and of course they've been on the pill so long they're probably going to have fertility issues but anyway let's not go there (laughs) I think it's a whole system problem and that you can't really pick apart any part of it without looking at the whole setup and doctors are as much in a way victims of that whole system Of course, they do have more authority and individual doctors do choose to start doing, taking a different attitude towards young women and do talk more about the pill. But I actually think that's got worse rather than better. I mean, I remember being on the pill in the mid 70s and I had started to get palpitations and I went to see a doctor who said, oh, I think you should come off the pill. It might be related to that. And yet now I hear stories of I just heard of a woman who had high blood pressure went to the doctor who put her on the pill. And the doctor said, don't worry, you don't have to come off the pill. We'll just put you on a blood pressure medication as well. What? You know, so I think this idea that we can manipulate our bodies has actually in some ways got worse over the last 20 to 30 years. And we see it in all kinds of ways, you know, that we can perfect the idea we can perfect the body. And that part of perfecting the body, I think in in many women's minds who work, particularly women who work in mainstream contexts, is that perfecting the body means doing away with the menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd love to talk about that concept a little bit more because, I mean, even the obsession with regulating the cycle, that whole (laughs) idea that the cycle needs to be regulated You know, one of the biggest challenges that I have, so you know that my work is as a fertility awareness educator, holistic reproductive health practitioner. And one of the biggest challenges I have working with clients is really helping them to demythify themselves, I guess, to really embrace your cycle as it unfolds without really believing all of that stuff that we've been programmed our whole lives. So, you know, the cycle's supposed to be 28 days. I'm supposed to ovulate on day 14. And if anything happens outside of that context, there's something wrong with me. And we need to get, fix it and get it into it, its proper, you know, way. As opposed to recognizing that your cycle is an intimate part of you and it unfolds as it does based on all of the things that are happening in your life. Meaning that there's nothing wrong with your cycle if you have a stressful situation and your your ovulation is delayed that's actually how your body works and that's okay that's right (laughs) that's right it is such fascinating territory this because because really the menstrual cycle can be seen as a sort of nexus of the epic conflict between the human being on one side and the larger capitalist still patriarchal urge to make more and more money out of machines and turning human beings into machines. So there's a humanity, nature, ecology issue on the one hand. So, you know, what actually, how the human being was designed over millennia to survive and to flourish and to breed to ensure the ongoing nature of the human species. That's all on the one side. And then on the other side, you've got short term profit motive. And these two are in an epic struggle. And one of the reasons I'm so interested in in the menstrual cycle is because it epitomizes that struggle, the way it's treated socially and the way women experience it. But also that this is the big conflict that we're moving towards really is between the need of the environment. And in a way, the, the female body is a microcosm of the larger environment. And on the other hand, this idea that making profit is more important than anything else. So that's why we've got climate change now. You know, we've known about climate change for over 40 years. You know, we've known that we were doing things to the planet and with the planet, that we were not acting collectively as awakened stewards of our planet, unlike many indigenous cultures. 
Instead, we were acting like rapists, essentially. We were just taking, as humans, taking what we wanted. And certain organizations and people and governments were more devoted to short-term gain than to long-term stewardship. We've known this for a long time, actually since the 1960s. Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, came out in in 1963 or something. Mm -hmm. So this is not new information, and yet we're still heading, you know, hurtling headlong towards disaster. And we now have a president in the US who's, you know, saying that climate change doesn't necessarily exist or whatever. So this is remarkable, actually, and, and shows how complicated it is, really, being a human being and trying to hang on to your humanity in this world that is really driven by a profit motive. Well, why is it that we can't stop and look around? So to contextualize that question, from my perspective, as someone who has spent a lot of time thinking about the menstrual cycle and talking about the menstrual cycle, and obviously through the vehicle of fertility awareness, I mean, like, open your eyes and what you see are, you know, millions of women with messed up cycles, fertility challenges, women needing to have extraordinary measures to have babies. At what point do we stop and look around and ask, why is this happening? At what point do we stop thinking it's normal for everyone to need IVF to get have a baby? I know, it's extraordinary. I don't know what it's going to take. Certainly, it takes individual awareness. And I think people's desire to be healthy is is really important. So there's a change happening now where people <laughs> think that are starting to believe that they have a right to be healthy. Now, people didn't necessarily think so much in that way. They were prepared to put up with a certain level of underutilized well-being, shall we say, or, you know, they would eat food that wasn't great or put up with things because there were more pressing concerns. But I think now one of the side effects of neoliberalism is is a certain amount of narcissism. And it's possible that there could be a benefit to that narcissism in the long term if it makes people really want to look after themselves very well into old age. That, you know, there's so many different ways this can all play out. It's hard to know really what's happening. We're in the mishmash of different body messages and different social messages. But if people do become, you know, really interested in their personal health, and if this message that we teach about the the value of a, a fully lived menstrual cycle and the impact that has on your long-term health as well as your fertility you know, that might be a lever in to start changing things. But I think ultimately the the system of white male privilege of really of of capitalism being able to run amok, basically, that system has to change. And we have to start looking after each other better. You know, there are issues like, you know, the way healthcare is dealt with in the United States. I mean, it is just staggering to me, especially having grown up in Europe, where socialized healthcare is a norm, that this is still an issue in the wealthiest country in the world. That women people don't not... get maternity leave. Yeah. Any of I it. Mean, Zero. It's absolutely shocking. I mean, you live in Canada too, which has, you know, a much more sane system. So when you look at the US from the outside, it just looks like madness. Now, how come they can't organize this better? Obviously, it's a, it's a challenge, but it's not impossible. At least you could do a hell of a lot better than Mm -hmm. they're doing now. But again, you've got certain financial groups and their interests. You've got, you know, the insurance companies in the US have a lock on healthcare and, of course, make an enormous amount of money from it. It's just very difficult to see how all of this can unfold without changes to the political system. And these don't necessarily have to be extremely radical. We could keep roughly the sort of system that we have, but by tweaking it. You know, we've got much more is being talked about in the UK now about the need to support and actually deal with the fact that there's a growing underclass. You know, an underclass isn't good for anybody. You know, it means there's more crime. It means there's more drug use. It means society itself is less stable. Now, that doesn't serve society in the long run. I know we're getting into real macro topics here and we probably need to talk a bit more about menstruation itself. But Well, one term that I just wanted you to just expand on for the listeners that aren't aware of what it is, you mentioned neoliberalism a couple of times. Could you tell us what that is? Yeah. Neoliberalism is really an, an extension of previous developments which have meant that capitalism has become less and less fettered by regulation. 
So the deregulation of the financial industry, which started in the 1980s in the US and UK, changes in the education system where education stopped being supported by governments and has become more and more up to the individual to fund themselves. So that before neoliberalism, there had been more idea that governments should supply certain aspects of individual lives. Under neoliberalism, we start to have more and more emphasis placed on the individual. So how this has played out in terms of how we relate to our bodies is that the individual is responsible for everything in their life. Then, you know, people start paying more attention to their fitness. So there can be a benefit to it. But on the other side of it, people can start feeling very stressed and anxious because it's all down to them. So we stop acting so much in a tribal socially connected way. We've gradually seen the separation of individuals from their society. People are moving around the planet a lot more, you know, that the, the boundaries have gone down. But at the same time, there's been a rise in anxiety and depression. So all the freedom that we have, which is what neoliberalism is really about, you know, corporations are much more free and so are individuals. But on the downside of that is a lack of social cohesion. Mm -hmm. So neoliberalism is a big topic. I could talk about it for a long time, but really it's characterized by deregulation. Mm -hmm. It sounds like then the responsibility shifts. So then it shifts onto our shoulders, which comes with some good and some challenge. That's right. And it also is good for capitalism because if you're not sharing things, everybody's got to own their own thing. Right. And even these new ideas like ride sharing, which Uber calls itself ride sharing, it's not ride sharing. You know, the people who are making the money out of Uber are the owners of Uber. The Airbnb, in a way, looks like a form of sharing, but it's still based on a capitalist model where the people who make the money out of Airbnb, the big money that there is to be made out of it, are the company itself. So these organizations are not being set up as cooperatives. Really, we need to develop more of a cooperative model. There, there are a lot of cooperatives in the world, but they're mostly in developing countries. But in, in what we call the developed world, or better called the global north, those societies tend to be moving more, even more towards multinationals, major capitalist players, and less and less from the cooperative model, but using the way the cooperative model looks to make it all look cozy and friendly. That's very mm. neoliberalist. I see. Yeah. So making it look like it's a shared system, but it's yeah. there's, there's still a top the person and that person is still making the onslaught or, of the money. Um, or group of shareholders. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. You know, it's really interesting to me whenever I, you know, have the privilege of speaking to, you know, with this, the podcast, I speak to women of all different generations. And I know the work that you do, and you've touched on it a little bit, is just within the context. So it's hard for me to imagine growing up 60 years ago, or it's just impossible for me to imagine what it would have been like for women in the 60s, who that was when birth control first became a thing. So it's hard to imagine what life was like for them. So it's helpful to think about things in that context, just to see why we have certain challenges now, like the remnants from the past. But for younger women, it's hard to imagine. It's so different now for us. One of the topics that I wanted you to talk a little bit about is the concept of reproductive labor. When you brought that topic up in one of your lectures, it was very interesting to me, just the idea of even the idea of menstruation as being a form of unpaid reproductive labor. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so women bear the burden of reproducing the human race, right? <laughs> Men just do, you know, an act for a few minutes. And then a woman actually carries the growing developing fetus she gives birth to it which is where we usually hear the word labor used then she feeds it through her body and then every month she has a period which is part of her ability to conceive and carry a baby right you can't produce new human beings unless you have a menstrual cycle so i see the entirety of the you know the work that happens that's connected to reproduction as being reproductive labor. It's not just that one act of pushing a baby out of your body. There's many, many hours of time that are spent dealing with everything that allowed for that baby to be pushed out of your body. I cast all of that as reproductive labor and I include 
having a period within that. So this is a very radical idea because then you get to the point, well, if that's labor, then surely it should be paid <laughs> because we do get paid for labor. That's, that's how the world works, right? We work for society, we get paid for it. So women do this enormous piece of work for society, making new humans, right? Mm -hmm. Without which society could not continue. And it's done unpaid. Now, it used to be paid in that, a certain sense, in that some women would marry a man who would support them financially. The old way of organizing this would be that the man went out to work, he brought back the money, the woman performed all the reproductive labor, and he, you know, gave her money. So in a sense, she's being paid by her husband for her reproductive labor. Now, there's good sides to that, which are that, you know, I remember when I grew up, my mother was a housewife. She was a wife and mother, and she worked to, you know, look after all of us. And so when she had her period, I can remember she would not work as hard. She would put her feet up for the afternoon and read a book. And that was fine. It didn't disturb anybody. She could, she could map out her work for the month around her menstrual cycle without it being a problem. She didn't have to cook a fancy meal that night. You know, she wouldn't, you know, wittingly anyway, plan to have a party or something around that time. So she could adjust her workload. But of course, the downside was that she never earned money in her own right. So she never had the sense of personal agency and personal accomplishment that the men had in that situation, right? So, so women didn't develop in confidence in that way. And it was easy for them to feel somewhat lesser because they weren't so accomplished. So my generation, women who were born in the 50s and 60s, many of us had mothers who hadn't worked in a professional sense outside the home. Of course, they'd all work very hard, but not outside. And so th and those mothers really encouraged us to develop careers because they understood that they were somewhat unactualized as, as people, that they had many talents that hadn't been recognized or rewarded or that they hadn't got to develop because they'd only been inside a home. So there was an upside and a downside. So in this period of adjustment, which we're still in, women are going out to work and they're experiencing what it means to have financial autonomy. It means you can, you know, you can leave an abusive husband. You can have the great pleasure of excelling at some kind of work. You can feel part of something bigger than just a family. You can actualize yourself to a much greater degree and contribute and be part of society. So that's incredibly valuable. But so far, most of that has been at the cost of really being in a female body and feeling okay about that. Mm -hmm. Well, and having to, having to give up some of that by trying to fit into this very male world. And to be honest with you, you know, I didn't really feel, I mean, sometimes you feel it obviously when you have like for me, I, I had really painful periods. So I, you know, fit right in there. And so yeah, I would feel, you know, a little bit like, oh, and I have to, you know, you have to go to work, you have to perform when really you just want to crawl in your bed and relax. So, you know, I had sick days, and there were occasional times when I would take those. But I feel like I didn't really feel that, that like round peg trying to fit into the square hole or whatever until I had kids. And then all of a sudden, it was like, hey, yeah. wire. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I think this is really common. And, and it's so interesting in the statistics for women who are on the pill is that there's a you must know about this, I'm sure that there's a big drop off of women who take the pill after women have their first child. Mm -hmm. You know, some women go back to it, but a lot of women having their child is actually an initiation into their body. And so they've been able to deny the body quite successfully to themselves, no matter what the fallout might have been for that. But they've been able to deny the body until they have a child. And then it gets much harder because you've been absolutely dragged into your body. Now, of course, if you have a highly medicalized birth, that may not happen. I think very medicalized births in a way serve to continue to keep women separate from the body. And if there have been complications and you haven't been able to successfully uh, breastfeed, then, you know, the I do see women who have children, but who still stay very detached from their body. But the statistics, I think, indicate that part of the reason why there's a drop off in women taking the pill or other kinds of hormonal conception after birth is that they, they've had this initiation. Do you think that's true? I think it's true because you feel 
like something that happens <laughs> when you're not on a hormonal form of birth control. Having your cycle is a very powerful thing. I've spoken about that a lot on the show. And you just get women together talking about it, you know, for so anyone listening, if this is kind of your initiation into this type of conversation, if you are around women, and you actually cycling women, and you talk about their experiences, and how their emotions shift on their periods, and how, what that means for them in their lives with their partners, with their families, with their friends, you really start to get a sense of how powerful it is. And so yes, that doesn't surprise me at all. Once you are, as you said, dragged into your body, you kind of like it there. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, there's also another aspect to it, which is that, of course, once a woman's had her first child, it's possible that she feels more secure in her life situation. So having another child wouldn't be a disaster. So we have to also factor that in. And that a lot of what has women in their 20s using birth control is the terror that they will get pregnant before they're ready, or before society says they're ready. I think that the you know, detachment of having your first child from the biological age when it would have been most appropriate for you, splitting those two things often by a factor of 15 or 20 years, I think is actually disastrous for women. And I think that's also a part of neoliberalism. You know, one of the ways neoliberalism has affected women is by really insisting on a deferred gratification for relationships as well as for having children. So, you know, most women now see their 20s often as a time of experimentation in relationships, just as young men have historically, and that they defer actually getting married until they're in their 30s. So there's a sort of tenuousness to the 20s. You know, it's not seen as a time when you make any firm commitments. You put all of that off until your 30s or even 40s. This is also all part of women being more like men. And there's an upside to it in terms of women's financial security, possibly. But the whole picture doesn't stack up with women's biology. Well, and the more you learn about the biological aspects of it, I mean, it's a complicated conversation because there's a lot of women out there that, you know, they you don't want to be defined by your age and you don't want. But at the end of the day, your best, you know, years, let's preface this by saying I did not have a child in, in my 20s. So let's preface it by saying that I, I didn't do this because I'm part of this structure of the system yeah. as well. Yeah. So I'm not trying yeah. to say that I am different because I'm not different. Yeah. But ultimately especially even I'm not old by any means. So Laura, I'm 34 at the time of this recording, not at the time it's released. I'll be 35 by the time it's released. And so, <laughs> you know, young, right? Except that I'm not from a reproductive standpoint. I'm actually not young. And yeah. it is different. It is harder to carry a baby. It is harder yeah. on your body when you get older. And so there's and also, a profound mismatch between yes. when we're having babies and when our bodies are actually in the ideal position for it. Yeah. That's absolutely right. And also, we now know that um, the health of sperm changes. It, there used to be this idea that, hey, men's sperm is just as good, you know, when they're 60. I mean, who thought of that? Only men, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and of course, we now know that along with everything else, you know, the quality of sperm deteriorates. So we're actually adversely affecting the gene pool. This is very controversial. We're not allowed to say this kind of thing. But in fact, you know, to make a strong gene pool, you would have both partners reproducing in their early 20s, right? Yeah, you would. That's, you know, that's when a woman's, a woman's body has fully matured to carry a child to term in the most successful way in her early 20s. That's when male sperm is at its healthiest, as long as, you know, this is somebody who's not doing drugs and drinking and who's eating right. And so that's how you make strong gene pool. So we're now actually disturbing our what we carry through into the future genetically by putting off having children for as long as we're doing it so you know i don't know what the long-term ramifications are going to be of course nobody does but it it doesn't look that great now to bring it back to how we organize the menstrual cycle this is all interrelated because putting off childbearing means that women need to be on or think they need to be on some biologically altering form of contraception for sometimes 20 years. So the situation of 
being out at work but suppressing the cycle it's becoming the norm one way or another so either you're just not ovulating and you're suppressing the cycle in that way but you're having a breakthrough bleed every month so it kind of feels like you're having a period so you still tell yourself you're having a period but in fact as we know it's not a real period it's withdrawal bleeding for one week a month or you're taking the pill all the way through or using a form of contraception that completely suppresses menstruation so and and the statistics are really high now uh, I, don't, I don't know what it is in the us and canada at the moment but in australia it's something like 75 percent of undergraduates are using some form of hormonal medication which suppresses ovulation so this is really you know it's really high and we still don't know what the long-term effects of this are if we come back to what we talked about at the beginning, that we know that there's something about having a menstrual cycle that makes you feel like yourself. What is that feeling like yourself? And how does it disturb women to go through 20 years of not feeling like themselves before they have their first child? And does that, in fact, make them more docile in the workplace? Does it make them fit in more easily if women aren't like the quite like themselves if they're not in their full power does it make them easier to control and is that somehow part of this picture yeah the implications are really stark because as a woman who has been in her body you know for since i was 18 <laughs> after my short stint with the pill i know that life would be different if i was on it and so how do you think it would be different? What do you think would be different? Well, I don't believe I would have enjoyed sex as much. Mm hmm. Yep. And that's a really big deal. What I always say my experience of menstruation has been that every time I have my period, it's like a it's like a reminder system. So if there's anything mm -hmm. that's really important in my life that I need to look at, it is brought to my attention. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yep. whether that's a relationship, a job, if I'm not pursuing my passion, whatever it is, I'm desperately unhappy during my period if I'm not really following what I should be doing. If I'm not really, mm -hmm. and I would take it to the level to say, if I'm not really fulfilling my purpose here on earth, then I'm desperately unhappy during my period. I would go that far to say mm -hmm. that. So I believe mm -hmm. that my life would be different because I wouldn't have that nudge. Mm -hmm. So imagine a world in which every woman has that reminder every month. Imagine that world. Imagine that world in the context of climate change. Imagine that world in terms of the context of taking care of the homeless, of creating social systems that actually take care of people who can't cope. Imagine that world in terms of healthcare. You know, we're looking at a radically different world if every woman, every time she menstruates, is pulled into her centre and into a sense of knowing what's right. So we're talking about something which is r not only radically empowering for the individual, but radically empowering for society and potentially deeply transformational. Is it surprising that we have collectively, you know, agreed to be medicated out of this knowledge? <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's powerful yeah. stuff, Laura. Yeah. To bring our conversation to a close, I want you to touch on the idea of conscious menstruation. We've already kind of started there and you've painted us a picture of what the world would be like. And I'm so happy to be in this conversation right now because I really believe it. I feel it. I feel that when you speak to women who have their menstrual cycles suppressed for an extended period of time, you feel the pain that they experienced. Like you feel the wound of it. And mm -hmm. I completely agree. And I, I share that question with you. I believe the world would be different. I, I'm just curious as to how it would look. I'd love for you to touch on what is conscious menstruation to kind of okay. help us bring our conversation to close today. Well, I just want to touch back to the concept of neoliberalism and to explain that a little bit. And, and that will help me talk about conscious menstruation. So in neoliberalism, it looks as if things are generally less regulated and in some ways they are but in other ways they're more regulated so we have more surveillance on us as individuals than we ever had had before and one of the things that conscious menstruation does is it 
it's a time in the month that connects you, as you've made the point, Lisa, with your inner knowing. And this is something that no amount of surveillance can actually really get to and take us away from. So in a society which where the private has become very public, we still need to have, I think, for the benefit of our souls, we need to have a private and an inner life. You know, the inner life is something that wise human beings have talked about from, you know, the ancient Greeks on through knowing who you are and being able to come from to life from the inside out is is really, really important to your mental and physical health. It's a building block of our self-esteem, knowing that we know right from wrong in our own mind and knowing that we know something about who we are as a soul, not just as a consumer, not just as, as, as a student or a worker, but knowing who we are as a soul. That's what conscious menstruation taps us into. So if you can spend a little bit of time every month when you have your period, just by yourself, even if it's only an hour, just being quiet by yourself and maybe making a few notes about what comes up for you, just to give yourself a, a space in the month where you are just you with you and where you're listening Rather than telling yourself or being told what you should think, what you should wear, what you should do, instead you're just listening. There is a deep inner voice in all of us. And listening to that voice is really, really a crucial part of our humanity. It's not a bolt on. You know, it's not something that we buy. It's not something that we can get. It's innate and it's been in you ever since you were born. It's something that you can see in a baby's eyes. You can see what makes that baby different to any other person who's ever been born. And it's that spark of difference and that spark of humanity that we have to get back to and we have to engage with. And being a woman is an incredible thing because every time you bleed, you have a wide open door to that spark of humanity. So please take it. Hmm. Wow. Thank you for that. And last question of the day, you know, for someone who literally just found the podcast last week (laughs) and has been invited into this knowing and really into a sisterhood of, of truly embracing the menstrual cycle, how would you suggest that woman and all of us really start embracing menstruation and start really being conscious about it? Well, the great thing about doing this work is that your body actually knows how to do it. So, you know, women have been menstruating for millennia. The menstrual cycle is intricately bound up with all the other cycles of life and it's affected by all the other cycles of life. And you can come to learn this and understand it by studying yourself. And the easiest way to do that is to keep a diary and just every day make note of where you are in your cycle. So start on the first day of bleeding and write day one. And then, you know, you could write the date and you could also, if you were interested, write what phase the moon is in, but you don't have to do that. But just start with writing day one and then just make a couple of notes about how you feel. You know, are you bleeding heavily? Are you cramping? Is this an easy period or a more challenging period? Is there anything you're upset about in your life? Is there anything you're excited about? Is anything really going on or is it business as usual? Just make a couple of notes. It needn't take you more than five minutes. And then do that every day, day two, day three, day four, day five. If you just track your own cycle, for a few months, you'll come to learn some things about yourself. And then if you want to get more involved, you can start doing more elaborate charting of your cycle, especially if you want to use it as an aid to uh, conception, contraception, or your overall health. But I really, really recommend that you do this because this is a way to really be in your body and be integrated with this fundamental aspect of being in a female body biologically it's yours you might as well live it oh laura thank you so much those are incredible words to end on i could stay in this conversation all day but i know at some point we have to bring it to close thank you so much for being here and for really opening our eyes and sharing your experience and all you know your study this is your field of study you've been studying this field for so long so i really appreciate you Uh, sharing your knowledge with us today. 
Well, thanks so much, Lisa. It's been great talking to you. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks a lot for all the work you do with Fertility Friday. It's just fantastic. Well, thank you so much. And so where can our listeners go to find out more about you and your work and also to pick up a copy of Her Blood is Gold? So I have a website, which is called laraowen.com. Not very difficult to find. So that's L-A-R-A-O-W-E-N.com. I send out a very sporadic newsletter these days because I'm so busy writing other stuff. But do sign up for it if you go to my website. You certainly won't be inundated. (laughs) And then Her Blood is Gold is available everywhere. There's a, a Canadian edition and obviously an American edition. So you can buy it on Amazon or from your local bookstore they can order it if they don't have it in stock Uh, so it's called her blood is gold awakening to the wisdom of menstruation and it's published these days by archive publishing it's on its third edition now so that's how you can get hold of that and then you can follow me on twitter at laura owen and you can also um, follow me on facebook on at laura owen writer okay well i will put all of those links in the show notes page so if you're on the go you don't have to worry about writing that all down but laura thank you so much for being here it was such a pleasure to have this amazing conversation with you today thanks so much lisa take care bye thank you for listening if you enjoyed today's show please share it with a friend you'll find today's episode at fertilityfriday.com slash 173 That's fertilityfriday.com slash 173. I hope that you enjoyed my episode with Laura. It was such a great opportunity to chat with her and really delve into the topic of menstruation and really getting into just that idea of reclaiming your power. And so there's a few takeaways that, you know, I have just from our conversation. One of them is how important menstruation is. And what I really like about the way that Laura talks about it is to really put that into context. You know, without menstruation, there would be no next generation. And so if you can wrap your head around that, then all of a sudden it becomes clear how important it is. And it also becomes clear how completely ridiculous it is that we relegate menstruation as something that is disgusting or dirty or bad or wrong when every single human being on earth is here because of their mother's menstrual blood. So that's something I feel really strongly about because growing up in this culture, as women, we have to overcome years of being inundated with the idea that there's something wrong with us, there's something wrong with our bodies, that there's something wrong about bleeding and that you know bleeding is gross when it's literally the reason that we're all here. And so I really encourage you to sit with that. You know, if this is something that is the very first time that it's been put that way to you, if you yourself have had a hard time accepting menstruation, embracing menstruation, and if you're still somewhere on that path of, you know, I still think my menstruation is gross, I still hate getting my period, then I really just want to invite you into this conversation. And I want to invite you to think about your menstruation differently. There is power in menstruation and it's often hard to to talk about because it's such a personal experience. You know, for every woman going through her period and really taking that time during her period to see what comes up and to experience that cycle after cycle and to experience how your period can shape your life and your emotions in different ways. So, you know, one of the common things that I hear women say is that, you know, during menstruation, I get really, you know, cranky, I get really irritable, I have more fights with my partner. And, you know, although there is a range of normal, (laughs) so that I can't say that there's never a case where there might be some sort of problem, right? Like depending on how severe the mood shifts are. So not to minimize the very real experiences of women who have, you know, really dramatic shifts in mood that are actually problematic. But with that being said, you know, I always make jokes about little things. And so what I would say is, you know, you're not mad that the sky is blue or or something like that (laughs) during your period. It's something real. It's a real thing usually. And so I would encourage you to honor that. And I would encourage you not to be so quick to dismiss any feelings that do come up for you during your period. 
I would encourage you to connect with those and to really ask yourself or even just to write them down and have a look at them then when you're outside of your period, because maybe that can help you just to connect with the fact that, you know, your period might heighten your perspective and your emotions around certain things, but it's not just completely illogical or irrational. So I would invite you to really sit with those things that come up for you during your period and really think about them critically, you know, and ultimately the goal is to have you not just dismiss those feelings as, oh, I was just on my period, because that is a very powerful time for for all of us as women to experience. One of the other topics that I just, I really love uh, talking to Laura about is that idea of, of reproductive labor, just that idea of the simple fact that, you know, as women, we are responsible for bearing, you know, the next race of human beings, that somehow that is not considered to be important. And it's something that is very undervalued by our culture. And the idea that our culture is structured in such a way that prevents us in many ways from having babies at the optimal time for our bodies. So to really just ignore all of that um, and instead focusing on just the way that our that our culture is. Like, and I can't say that it's not very real. I mean, in order to have a family in our society, you need to have money, you need to have, be able to feed your kids and you need to have a place for them to live and you have to be able to take care of them. So it puts us as women in a hard situation, having to, you know, secure the career, do all of those things first before having kids, but it puts us in a way at odds with our body. So I don't really have an answer, but I think it's important to talk about these things, to raise these questions and to really think about it. What if the world was different? You know, like what if it was embraced for women to have their kids young when they were healthy and when their cycles are healthy and when your eggs are super, you know, young. And as Laura was talking about, sperm quality is optimal. What if our culture did encourage us and support us to have babies early? What would that look like? I'm just asking the question, you know, because I think it needs to be asked. And I think that I don't I don't have the answer and I don't think that it's going to change overnight. But I wonder about that. I wonder about it often. So, you know, if this conversation has been interesting to you and informative, I would really like to invite you to continue the conversation over in the private Facebook group that I host for the Fertility Friday community. So if you haven't yet joined us in there, you can head over to fertilityfriday.com slash community and you'll get a link for to join us in there. And so, you know, I will be raising some questions around menstruation in the group when this interview airs because it's a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. And I really like connecting with other women and finding out what their experiences have been. You know, what has your experience been of menstruation? If you didn't menstruate for years, if you were on hormonal contraceptives, what was that like? If you've transitioned from hormonal contraceptives to having your natural cycles, what was that like? And in all fairness, it's not always a walk in the park. A lot of women transition off of hormonal contraceptives only to find that it's, it's not just smooth sailing period of time of transition, a period of time of hormonal influx where things shift around and change. But either way, I think it's important for us to talk about those experiences and share them because the only way that we can all be invited into really experiencing our bodies, experiencing menstruation and the health benefits that come with that, you know, the health benefits that come with not suppressing your cycle with powerful hormones is to talk about it and to raise awareness about it. So make sure to join us in there if you're not in there already, fertilityfriday.com slash community. And just as a reminder that registration is closing for the 2018 January group program. So if you're wanting to be part of Fertility Awareness Mastery, uh, basically a little bit of information about the program if you're new to the podcast is that, you know, a couple of times a year I offer a 10 week group program where I connect you with a group of anywhere from, you know, six to 10 women and we meet on a weekly basis over a 10 week period and really delve into fertility awareness charting. 
So by the end of the group program, what happens is that you are confident in charting your cycles. You fully appreciate and understand the fertility awareness method. You're able to chart your mucus. You're able to understand your basal body temperature fluctuations and your cervical position if you decide to chart that. Um, but beyond that, you leave feeling with a sense of empowerment that only comes from really understanding your body. So not only do you get the logistics of, okay, this is how you chart, this is, you put this here and okay, you do that there, but you also leave with the, the confidence and the ability to, you know, interpret your charts, to really know what it means and to connect what's happening in your menstrual cycle with your overall health. And so you leave with this knowledge and the sense of empowerment that will stay with you throughout your entire reproductive life. And so I really would encourage you if you're thinking about joining the group to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash group program and apply. I will be closing registration. Holidays are coming and so the cart will be closed and I won't be accepting any new uh, registrations for the January group. So if you want to make sure that you are included and that you're part of it, make sure to head over there and apply. And so I just want to thank you so much for listening to the podcast. I want to thank you for supporting the show. I podcast for you and I really appreciate all of your support. I appreciate all of you for sharing the episodes with your friends and also for being part of the Fertility Friday community. If you're not yet part of our Facebook community, make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash community and you will receive your invitation to the group. We will be talking in there about today's episode and lots of other great topics related to fertility awareness. So make sure to join us in there. And so thanks again, and as always, be well and happy charting.